Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Anna Kabeca. I'm here today on Couch Talk with Dr. Jack Cruz, who has been a dear friend. He's a respected neurosurgeon. He's the CEO of Optimized Life, which is a health and wellness company dedicated to helping patients avoid the healthcare burdens we typically encounter as we age and in our standard of care medical systems. He resides in the Gulf Coast in New Orleans, getting ready to celebrate Mardi Gras. And he created the EpiPaleo prescription, which emphasizes five key concepts that go against conventional thinking. And these are key. The first one, the timing of when you eat is more important than what you eat. The second, snacking or eating small meals every two to three hours as commonly advocated by conventional medicine, all but guarantee lifelong obesity. And the third is that anyone can lose massive amounts of weight without ever counting a calorie. He also, um, the fourth concept is rigorous cardiovascular exercise, like long distance running or chronic cardio routines leads to stem cell reduction and shaves years off the end of your life. And the fifth is that eating fats, conventional medicine told us to shun is ideal for optimal health. His website is Jack Cruz with a K, K R U S E M D. He's a wealth of really cutting edge science and energetic medicine and is my go-to person when I have a concept question I want to get out there I want to understand the truth of why this is happening or why we we're not overcoming a certain physiologic or biologic issue and Jack has the answers so Jack welcome today thank you I wouldn't say I have the answers I just like digging for them I and that's that's the key that's where I think originally the uh, magnetism with you was is like searching for the truth no matter what we're doing or practicing I'm willing to say hey I was wrong with that and you are too and say okay well this is the truth behind it well you remember we both went to medical school we were taught a lot of things that we we now found out are precepts of the truth they're not actually fundamental concepts of nature and the thing is that I find at least with most physicians if they've not been too polluted by the system is that you remember when you wrote your medical school essay, you were very altruistic and you really wanted to be a doctor to help people. Well, I think when people start to understand the fundamentals of light, water, and magnetism, that's when you actually go back and tap the person that you were before you went to medical school when you were bright eyed and bushy tailed and you really wanted to know truly how things work. Well, and, you know, at some point in our medical careers, we recognize that we're not healing with our prescription pad and our knife, right? Not at the foundational level. Like, it's one thing to arrest the problem and process versus get to the underlying foundational issues and see the problem completely disappear without having to write a prescription pad or to undergo surgery. And, and specifically, you know, for my passion in women's health and relational medicine, right, there's um, a lot of detriment to what we've created in our standard medical care system. Well, what, what I tell people, uh, and I try to leave it like little nuggets for people to think about, medicine and most of biology, most of randomized controlled trials, all the things that we pay for contain half truths. And one of the things that I've learned in the last 10 or 12 years of my life is that a half truth always leads to a full lie. And the key thing is you have to see or dig as the clinician or the patient to see why it's a half truth and then realize why it doesn't work. Uh, and I tell everybody who comes to my site uh, to read some of the details that I have. The reason the details are there is because the application of my information is not difficult to do. The details behind it are extremely difficult. And I tell people, it's brain surgery without a scalpel. Mm. I, I kid you not when I say that, that I believe that we can alter our DNA, our epigenetic programs just by the way we think. And it's no longer, you know, in the purview of woo or convent, uh, I should say alternative medicine. It's being proven every day. The problem is, when you're in medicine, when you're in the journals that you know you have to read for CMEs and things like that, this, these are not the go-to journals that people read. The books that have been published on the things that we're going to talk about today, most MDs, forget about patients now, most MDs don't even know that this data has been collated and assimilated into book form so that you can read it. And if you pull the bibliography in the back, 
you'll actually be shocked to see that some of these papers are already 100 years old, but yet they haven't made it into clinical medicine, and they've been reproduced uh, as well. So from that standpoint, I guess podcasts like this for me are kind of like we get to shine a light on what we already do know, but yet do not use, and that's the key. And today it's kind of going to be like shining the light from a lighthouse onto this whole area and breaking it wide open. And we're going to hit on some practical points because, and the science behind it, which Dr. Cruz is just amazing at revealing to us, because most of the, I mean, it's not taught in our medical schools, but we want to, you know, what I want to see and what we want to see is that it's practically taken into each of our lives so that we shift the tide of our medical systems, but we shift the tide of our lives and our and the generational lives that follow us. So today we're going to hit on a few topics and I'm um, hitting Jack without any prepara- preparation whatsoever, but really talking about the problem with sunglasses. The first thing, the second is no fear, see food. The third is indoor living as a cause of autoimmune disease and many diseases. And the fourth, talk about the paraventricular nucleus, healing the PVN, and how stress is a factor in that, and then water as medicine. So where would you like to start, Jack? Wherever you want to start. Let's let's go into light. You know, we, here we're both sitting here um, with eyeglasses on and talking about I and both are in the south and wearing eyeglasses versus sunglasses and how that's damaging and detrimental big surprise and well here's the thing Anna it's damaging for you but it's not damaging for me and there lies the difference so just for everybody who's watching this they see my glasses they see your glasses what's the difference between you and me I have blue tech lenses in there you don't know that okay I'm happen to be sitting in a house that's got blue light around me but if I move that right over there, you see that light? That's a UV light, okay? That's a UVA light. And then I'm going to go up a little further. And you see the ceiling, how it's got aluminum on it? That aluminum takes the UV light and brings it all around me. So I've got my eyes protected. Why did I get into all this before I answer these questions? It's very simple. Well, let's hit on that blue light bo- blockers like gunners or those. Any of those. Any of those need to be employed when you're indoors out of sunlight. Why? Let's start with the basics. Everybody probably listening to this thinks that the eye is a camera. That's what Anna and I learned in medical school. It turns out that that was proven not true about 10 years ago. A guy named George Brainerd found a new receptor in the eye called melanopsin that responds specifically to blue light. And it's blue light when it's the sun starts to set. So I have to teach you a little bit about quantum biology to start off with. When the sun rises in the morning, it has three main colors in it, blue, red, and green, okay? The eye camera, which is what we see with, is optimally designed to respond to the green wavelengths, okay? Now, blue light is what wakes us up in the morning. So what does it do? It fundamentally makes something called reactive oxygen species, Most of your listeners know that that is generally a bad thing, but here is where it's a good thing. When it comes in sun, that light goes in your retina, and that that blue light goes through a central retinal pathway that goes directly to your pituitary gland that turns your pituitary gland on. So it is the cosmic wand that wakes you up. What's the ultimate effect it has past the pituitary? Because I know most of your ladies are listening to this, want to understand how the hormones work. I want to teach you first how you wake up. After it goes through your pituitary, it goes into your brain. And in your brain, most of you know, there's nerves. There's another cell, however, called glial cells. And if you think about my two fists here, this is a nerve cell and here's a glial cell. Between these two is something called an aquapore foreign gate. And that runs water between the two. When blue light comes in, water goes through that gate, and it stretches the distance between neurons and glial cells. That stretch is what wakes you up in the morning. Mm. Now, here's the cool part of the sun. The sun has the antidote for the blue light toxicity or the stimulus uh, to protect us. And what is that part? It's red light. And the interesting thing is our sun atomically is built to have the same amount of blue and red. So anytime the sun is out, the antidote is always present. Therefore, blue light from the sun 
generally doesn't hurt us with one exception. At nighttime, when the sun's not due to be present, which is the reason why I'm wearing these glasses, because and has asked me to come on to this blue light Zoom meeting. Um, I'm on a computer. I've got some lights on in the house, which I normally don't do, but I'm offsetting my wrist because I have some UV light. Outside right now on Bourbon Street, it is 75 degrees and sunny. So as soon as we finish here, I will go back out there. The point that has to be made here is when you're indoors, as we are here, LED lights and fluorescent lights are the two predominant fake lights in the world. What most people don't know because they don't have spectroscopes, if you took a spectroscope and looked at the sun and then put it at an LED light, there's two frequencies that are missing. That's the UV and red. That's purple mm. and red. So that's part of the reason why you always see purple and red around me. And just for those of you looking, that's purple and red light. So I bring those back into my indoor environments. I generally turn all blue lights off. Uh, I, if I can tell anybody anything, that you need to have full spectrum sunlight uh, present as much as you can. So if you can build your house with windows open or constantly try to get outside, the key part of the morning stimulus is actually when the sun rises till about nine or 10 o'clock, depending on where you are on the planet. Uh, the reason for that, and this will be the shocking news probably for some, maybe even Anna, is what turns the hormone release off from 6 to about 9 or 10? UVA light on the skin. And guess what happens? UV light, when it hits the skin, takes your surface blood vessels that are about probably 4 or 5 millimeters below your skin, and it releases a chemical called nitric oxide and raises those to the surface. The reason why this is important, where all hormones released from the pituitary gland go, they go in the blood so they can get all throughout the body. Well, we have these two proteins that almost everybody knows about that are in red blood cells. It's called hemoglobin and the other one's called porphyrins. Most people may not know about the porphyrins, but this is all you need to know. Hemoglobin absorbs light in four key spectral patterns, three in the red and one in the UV. The one you need to pay attention to in the UV is 270 nanometer light. Okay, that's deep purple. The three in the red have to deal with water. What are red blood cells suspended in? Some of you may not know this, but 93% of blood plasma is water. And it turns out that water is what we call the ideal chromophore for red light. So what does that mean in English? It means that water is the ideal battery for sunlight. And what does battery entail? When I say it, I want to be very specific here. It means a charge separates water between a positive and a negative force. That's what a battery does even in your car. And for those of you who are biology aficionados, you'll like this, is that the first step in photosynthesis in a leaf also is the charge separation of water. And the goal there is to liberate electrons. And the reason for that um, there's a very nice researcher named Gerald Pollack from the University of Washington who's done some pretty exquisite um, experiments that have shown any time electrons are liberated in water, it makes something called an exclusion zone in water. And what's that? That's a battery. And it takes water into its positive and negative charges. It turns out that everything in biology is based on this negative charge. So when you hear this story, what should your goal be in the morning Almost every morning. When the sun rises, you need to be like the Sphinx. You need to be outside with your glasses off, not inside behind glass, behind a window. Why? Because glass alone blocks to UVA light. And the only UV light, even if you're on an equatorial area, that comes early, early, early in the morning is UVA light. You don't get any UVB no matter where you are. Generally, like where Anna is in, in around the Atlanta, Georgia area, you're not gonna get any of that UV light this time of the year until about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Down where I am, I'm a little bit more fortunate, 8, 30 to 9 o'clock. So I'm getting the benefit there. When you realize that, it makes you understand that why getting up when the sun rises and get into your eyes is huge. Most people in the alternative world, and I, I think even most people in the allopathic world, understand a little bit about vitamin D. That's the solar panel. But where Anna lives right now, she's technically in vitamin D winter until about April 15th. I never go in 
vitamin D winter. That's part of the reason why I relocated from Nashville down to the Gulf South because this is one of the few subtropical places in the United States that actually have UVB light all the time. And why is this important? If you guys get a, an app on the cell phone, it's called dminder.org. Uh, um, a guy named Dr. Holick, who is a researcher in Boston University, basically took all the data from the United States, all the latitude and longitude points, and put them into a database. You can actually download this for free and find out where you live, uh, what time UV light begins, and how much you actually physically make. Believe it or not, it even has an application that tells you exactly how many IUs of vitamin D3 you make per minute in the area you are. So if you're a biohacker like I am, you can actually tell what you're making at that time. The key point, however, with sunlight that I want to get back to with the glasses is when you wear uh, sunglasses on your face, or I should say on your eye, what you're physically doing is you're altering the spectrum that the retina sees. So let me give you an analogy for all of you to understand so it's very easy to get. If your husband, boyfriend, or girlfriend took uh, you to Home Depot and bought a tree and you put it in the ground and then you put the nutrients in it and you put all the minerals that it needs, but then you put a tarp over the top of it, would it grow? So why do you think putting sunglasses on your eye that allows the light to go into your brain through your pupil is not going to reduce the quantum yield of sunlight there? Point two, take a look at both me and Anna right now. Neither one of us came out of our mama with clothes on. That is our solar panel. And see, humans have the social and cultural belief that we should be covered up. Well, guess what? Biology doesn't care about our social and cultural beliefs. So what we've effectively done is create another mismatch where we put a, a, a thing over us. So even if you lived, say, in an equatorial zone, but you had American culture, you would be covered up. So effectively, you still wouldn't be making vitamin D. And it gets even worse when you consider that ophthalmologists tell everybody to wear sunglasses, the dermatologists tell everybody to wear sunblock. And I always bring this point out to them that if you look back from 1900 to 1950, that the rates of melanoma and skin cancer are extremely low, and that's before we ever had sunblock. Yes. Here's the key point. There was a gentleman that wrote a book that all of you should probably read. His name is John Ott, and the name of the book was Health and Light. He showed um, through some very slick experiments that cancer tends to show up when we have an altered light uh, environment. Now, this should be a big wake-up call to everybody because you can see the lights behind me and the lights above me. They're no bueno at all. Uh, and this is one of the things that is counterintuitive to a lot of the information I teach people because we are quantized beings, meaning that we run on light frequencies. And the problem is, Anne and I never were taught this. I mean, she'll tell you the basis of medical school, physics is not what we call one of the prerequisites. And it turns out, at least through my reading for the last 12 years, that physics is probably the only true primordial science to biology. And the reason that we've got most things wrong, the reasons why we sell people have truths is because we are fundamentally unaware that when in, in this eye, there's an eye uh, clock. And that eye clock works on that new photoreceptor that I told you about that we found 10 years ago called melanopsin. That is a blue light receptor. And the blue light is designed to be turned off when the sun sets. Here's our problem. We wear clothes outside, so we, get, we never get IR, which is red, and we never get purple during the day, and we bring blue light into our lives constantly. Here's the really take-home point. Most of you don't know that LED and fluorescent lights have a thing called color temperature. Color temperature tells us about the frequencies of light. Blue light in fake lights has four times the amount of blue the sun does, has no red, no purple. Guess what? That means that you have a constant turn on switch to your pituitary gland, which eventually, what does that lead to? It leads to a low hormone panel across the board, but eventually what else does it lead to? Which is something that Anna wanted to talk about. It turns off your paraventricular nucleus because it gets fatigued. 
So what the alternative health doctors and the anti-aging doctors talk about when they mention adrenal fatigue, Jack Cruz tends to get pretty upset about because there is no adrenal fatigue. I agree. Thank you. I, well, adrenal dysfunction. It's an adrenal dysfunction. It's like a backpedaling. Well, uh, it's not like our little glands have fatigued. No, it's, it's so a, resourceful. They're, tur they're turned off because of the signaling that are coming through our eye that go to this paraventricular nucleus in our brainstem. And this is the reason why I'm a stickler about this, because if we keep teaching people the bad terms, they're really not going to understand that wearing sunglasses or contacts potentially can be a big issue. So the reason I'm a fan of glasses versus contacts is you can't easily take your contacts out when you're at the beach or when you're walking on a nice street. I mean, if you happen to be walking with me here in the French Quarter, you will actually see me go from the shade to the opposite side of the street. Now, you don't have to do that. And the reason why people may not know this either, the human eye is blind to UV and IR light. We do not see it. But for example, most of you know that insects are always drawn to light. Why? They're always drawn to IR and UV light. Cats and dogs also see it, okay? So when you put these lights on and your animals react, uh, you'll understand why but you physically can't see it. And the reason you're not designed to see it is because your camera vision works on different frequencies than your clock vision. And it turns out that your clock vision is actually what controls your circadian biology. It controls every single hormone in your body, but here's the bigger issue. It controls all the regeneration pathways that occur in you during sleep. How it works is extremely complex biophysics, but it's important for you to know the basics, and the basics are this. This is the take-home. Get as much sun as you can in the morning time. It's the key part. When the sun is designed to set, try to keep all the artificial light in your house down. If you have to use light at night, begin to use either the gunners, the blue blockers, whatever, whatever you want to do to protect your eye clock. Uh, I'd also tell you, in the house, you probably should cover as much as your skin uh, I will tell you right now, I have shorts on, so I'm, I'm not following my own rules. Um, but the other thing is use uh, red light. You can actually use amber bulbs around your house. Uh, we have them here, but to be honest with you, um, I don't put them on um, during the day because I'm very rarely in the house. I'm always outside. The, the real unfortunate thing for most people in the United States is they don't live in a city like I do that's a walking city. Um, you know, there's very few of them left, but it's really, really important that people understand that the sun is not our enemy. We should stop burying the sun. Uh, and that's why I always tell people that if you look at ancient cultures, uh, if you happen uh, to be an aficionado of that, you'll notice that they were always sun-based, the Incas, the Aztecs, and the Egyptians especially. But I always tell people, look at the Sphinx. Why? It's been in the desert for 9,000 years. It looks directly to the east where the sun sets, I should say sun rises, and the body of the Sphinx is an animal, and the animal is completely connected to the earth. Mm. So if any of your people who are listening to this that know a little bit about electricity, you're designed to be recharged. Your battery is right here in your brain. The accessory battery is water. The light has to go through your skin and your eye to raise the charge in you, but your feet have to be connected to the earth. See, the earth is the anode. The sun and the sun's rays are the cathode. That's exactly how everybody's house is built. It has to be grounded. Otherwise, the electronics won't work. Um, and the funny thing is, we seem to get that about electronics and things that we build, but we don't realize it's a fundamental issue in biology. Well, we forget we're energetic beings, right? We are, you know, complete energetic sources. We're not meant to stand still. We're not meant, whether we're at a standing desk or a sitting desk, we're not meant to have this closed off from this closed off existence from the environment. So I want to hit some practical points here because listeners to our radio, uh, our podcast, et cetera, also busy moms or dads with kids. And I put gunners on my daughter. So blue light blockers for my daughter in her school system because she went from Montessori school to the public school. And, uh, you know, and that's in and of itself great as long as she remembers her glasses. So I can control a little bit of the environment. I bought 
red lights and UV lights. Uh, for my listeners, people have known that my father was um, really, really sick and hospitalized. So I was texting Dr. Cruz saying, okay, he's in the hospital, renal failure. What do I do? He's like, get, you know, reptile lights on him, UV lights and red lights and get those on him right away. And of course the hospital room made me take them down but you know was able to implement that when i got home but and so let's talk about like what do we what do we buy and that we would we don't then i my daughter put something over her red light and we had a fire in the house but so <laughs> Practical aspects, Jack. I mean, that's really crucial. We want that. And in the house, we want to create that. that I, think, um, I think the most practical thing, honestly, is in your house, start where you are right now. Do the easy things, what I call the easy things first. The first thing is eye protection at night, okay? If you know, you need to understand this. A lot of people in the United States don't. In 2009, our president got rid of one TV signal, and now we have LED TV. LEDs are one of the worst offenders for blue light. So if you want to get macular degeneration, cataracts, or any kind of eye disease really fast that eventually goes into neurodegeneration, just watch TV at night anytime. Now, for most Americans listen to this, they go, what? Yeah, that's the truth. Uh, you need to wear glasses like this. For example, when I operate, these are my glasses. The, and you'll notice same purple frames, but these are blue techs with BPI tints. These block all frequencies in purple and blue. These are actually better to wear at night. This is what I wear. Um, that you don't have to get the specialty ones. You can go buy UVEX glasses, gunners that are a couple dollars each. The key factor is in the morning, you need to be outside. Okay. So even if you're at work, people are going to say, well, I'm at work. I'm here. I'm there. Well, take a five minute break and go outside and get coffee. What's one of the tricks I use? When I go into my office, I immediately go get coffee. Half the time I don't get coffee, I'm actually just going outside. I tell people that's what I'm doing, but I don't do it. In between cases, days that I'm in surgery, I make sure that my, my surgery schedule doesn't start until eight o'clock. That's one of the big changes that I made in my schedule. And you know, Anna, as a surgeon, that we like to start seven in the morning and get going. Well, guess what? Six to eight is my time to be out getting sun on me. Do I expose my body as much as I can? The answer is yes, but here's the key point. In between cases, I have a place by the hospital where the helicopter lands. I go out there in between cases and don't sit in the surgeon's lounge. Even five, 10, 15, 20 minutes helps you. you don't, perceive that it's a help, but it helps you. So you need to understand that if you have an office, open the window. If you have the availability to get closer to the window or closer to a door that will let you go outside, do it. In other words, here's, here's one of my big take-homes. You, you can never get well in the same environment that you got sick in. And if you do not change your light environment, I don't care what you do, I don't care what you buy, I don't care what you believe, you will not get better. You, because that is a half truth. The sun is something that actually regenerates us. Anytime you can get it during uh, the times it's out is fine. And that includes cloudy days because even on cloudy days, you're getting the proper stimulus that you're designed to work with. So protect the eyes, protect the body when you're inside. But when you're outside, Here's where I get a little bit, I want you naked. As much as you can be naked. If my wife is here, she'll tell you. We do a lot of naked sunbathing. My kids the same way. This has become a big deal. The eyes are uncovered. So when I'm walking around the French Quarter, you'll notice, you'll see the glasses here or on top of my head, or I'll do this. And I'll put them on my nose. So when I need to see, I go like this. So there's many different ways for you to do it. That's the practicality of light. You know, and that that's so key that, you know, always believe in the sunrise and the sunset, right? Just really bathing in sunrise and sunset to start or to fuel our circadian biology. But you're saying all the way throughout the day, the five minutes here, five minutes there, and then taking right. down the sunglasses, which it's a blurry world for me, Jack. Well, that'll change because here's the thing. Huh? Sounds like 
Mardi Gras. Mardi starting. Gras starting. <laughs> um, here's the thing, Anna, and I've written blogs on this, and I don't want to get into it too much, but can you actually fix your eyesight? 10, 10 12 years ago when I was really big, uh, my eyesight was negative 7 point, I should say 6.75 diopters. Today it's negative 4.25. Why? Because I embrace UV light. You both, you know, and I know that if I told an ophthalmologist that, they would be like crazy for two reasons. A, they'd say UV light cannot improve myopia. Well, here's the thing. They believe that your, your, um, your lens blocks all frequencies of UV. Well, that's part of the reason I carry this around with me in my bag. This is a UV light. And anytime I see a doctor, I shine this on their retina. And you know what they see? They see fluorescence back on the retina. I said, why would you see fluorescence if the lens blocks it all? See, this is what you call a 30-second biohack to blow a doctor out the water. Mm. When they see that, they go, hmm. And I said, see, everything you were told, you have to start to question. And I explained to him, in the, in the lens, and this is probably something you've forgotten from medical school, there's a thing called the hyloid canal. It goes from the, the lens all the way to the retina, bisects right through. It's an open canal. You remember, light doesn't need a big area to get in. That connection still exists in everybody's eye. But see, the ophthalmologists don't realize this. And the real problem is when we go and have somebody who's got a cataract from blue light, which is the most common thing, ophthalmologists tell you it's UV light, they take it out and they put a UV blocking lens in. That means you can't get any UV light in. So you have to realize in their own literature, it's known that after you have a lens implanted for a cataract surgery, that people tend to get sicker, especially people who have metabolic syndrome and who have metabolic diseases. Why is that? What did I say to you earlier in this podcast? Anything that affects the central retinal pathways affects growth and metabolism. Here's the point. Think about what I just said. That means light controls food, not what we believe. And see, that's what makes me really, really difficult for the food gurus to deal with because light is a huge controller. Everybody seems to know about it when we deal with plants because we know that plants really is a photosynthetic issue, but people don't realize it's actually an issue with us too. Well, and I want to emphasize what you said before to really bring it home to our hormonal right aspects, our, our hormonal biology, and especially as we're getting older, but our youth are being affected by this um, UVB lights in that it creates this hypopituitary, hypopituitaryism or, or low production of our hormones. And we're seeing young men it's with low UVB, testosterone. Not UVB light, it's blue light that does it. Blue light is what causes... Um, the pituitary to shut down because it's overstimulating. So it drains down the pituitary. There's actually a syndrome in Japan called the celibacy syndrome. And if ever, anybody doesn't know about it, Google it. It's very simple. All the kids in, in the far East who are totally addicted to these things here, the cell phones and their cameras, they have such blue light toxicity that it turns off their sex steroid hormones and they don't want to have sex anymore. It's, it's actually been documented. Oh, I believe that. You know, we look at that with low testosterone, with, you know, that dopamine drive. So using energy, using ATP, we think, okay, well, that's it. It's, it's being spent on, you know, dopamine. It's being spent, your ATP, your energy is being spent on that way. So you're not producing your sex steroids. But here you're saying no, you're, it's... You're, you're overproducing them so that your pituitary begins to fatigue and it can't make it back. Here's the other part of the story that people miss. Dopamine is made by UV light. There's a thing in our eye called the RPE that has dense core granules. What people don't understand is dopamine, melatonin, serotonin, and melanin are all biogenic amines. They are made by aromatic amino acids. Aromatic amino acids all absorb UV light. So guess what the regeneration program is in your eye and your brain? It's actually UV and IR light. And this is the things that we're avoiding. So here we have created a world where blue is in everything, it shuts us down, and we can't regenerate anything. So let me give you the key take-home for the celibacy syndrome, because I'm sure there's tons of moms who have kids that are listening to this. If you give your kid an iPhone or an iPad, in my opinion, that is equivalent to taking your child out in the middle of Walmart and kicking the shit out of them. Wow. That's... 
okay? And I'm saying it, okay? Now I'm gonna show you why. When you Google this celibacy syndrome and you learn about it, you're gonna find out that not only the kids have no sex steroid hormones and have no drive to sex, but they're all myopic, meaning they're all nearsighted. And that's the reason why kids in the Far East, in the 1960s, only about 40 to 50% were. Today, it's 96%. So here's what you need to understand. When you become myopic, what are you doing? You alter the light frequencies that go through your lens into your retina that drives these central retinal pathways. So it gets worse and worse and worse. What do we now know from another researcher uh, who's at the University of Wisconsin? His name is Doug Wallace. We know that when you have an altered light frequency, it leads to something called mitochondrial heteroplasmy. You don't have to remember the fancy terms. I'll explain to you what it means. The more heteroplasmy you have, the worse your mitochondria work. The worse your mitochondria work on a percentage basis in every cell, just so everybody's clear, every cell has about 3,600 to 10,000 mitochondria. So the worse they work, it changes the disease phenotype you get. So for example, low sex steroid hormones is the first train stop in the story. Myopia is stop two. Then we have glaucoma. Then we have um, uh, macular degeneration. Eventually, you get to neurodegeneration. You got heart disease thrown in there. In other words, all diseases, all Neolithic diseases are caused by an elevated amount of heteroplasmy in the cell, meaning your mitochondria get worse, the disease changes. This concept is so foreign to most physicians because they don't go back and read the basic science. And this guy, Dr. Wallace, I kid you not, he, for, for you, Anna, you'll be very interested. He is the guy that figured out that we only inherit mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. This guy is this close to a Nobel Prize, but he's missing some of the key information that we've already talked about, which is Pollock's work with water. And I think when he understands that ATP is not the main driver of biochemistry, but light and water is, that's when uh, things are going to get really interesting. And the key point that I want to make to your listeners is that most of the things that Anna and I are talking about right now, you take the terms, put them in a Google box and look, you're going to see that they're there. The difference is there's not a lot of people out there connecting the dots for you. Me and Anna both know you're not doctors, but here's the, the irony. She knows and I know this. Doctors who are listening to this don't even know this. And see, that means that we're on level playing field. So once you realize how these processes work in your body, everybody, and I was one of these people, you know, 12 years ago, told me that if I wanted to lose weight and get optimal, that I needed to eat, eat less and exercise more, I found through all these processes that we're talking about right now, that I could eat more and exercise less if I acted more like the Sphinx. Mm. When I did my original biohack, did I believe what I just told you now? Not at all. Why? Because I was a conventional wisdom allopathic doctor. But here's the cool part. I realized that I did everything my profession told me to do to try to lose the weight, and I kept failing. So I remember this little voice in my head that I learned when I was in third grade from my teacher said, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and you fail, that's the definition of insanity. And it goes back to a guy named Einstein. He's the one who said it. And it turns out that Einstein, Da Vinci, and Michelangelo are the three guys that are my mentors. Mm. And I started to think about this and I said, you know, maybe the problem is the way I'm thinking about disease generation and I need to erase what I believe and then try something completely different. And that's fundamentally what I did. And I realized that light, water, and magnetism were the key missing pieces in biology. That's when, I, that's when I came up with the leptin prescription, cold dermogenesis, and started writing my blog, and I wrote a book about it. Now, in the beginning, did I tell anybody that the leptin prescription fundamentally was tied to light? No, I didn't. Why? As you guys are probably finding out right now, how we're talking about, all these little details are pretty complex. So I didn't want to lose people at hello, okay? Um, so what I decided to do is give them something that they could wrap their heads around and say, okay, this makes some sense to me. 
cold thermogenesis, very simple. You're using cold temperatures, it's the same thing a leaf does. If you could see my tree right outside my house on Bourbon Street, I have a magnolia tree. Magnolia trees are designed to live in subtropical zones. You know, they have big leaves and leaves angle down. That's how, and when I say like this, they angle like this. The reason why the sun here is so strong, the angle of inclination cools the leaf. There's only two ways a leaf can cool. Angle of inclination and these stomatal openings that release water on the leaf. You have them too. They're called apocrine sweat glands. Mm -hmm. That's how you cool your surface, okay? That's the reason chimps have hair and why we don't. We've changed our glands to sweat glands to cool our surface because we have frontal lobes that chimps don't have that are loaded with dopamine that need UV light to make this. So the more you cool, the more UV light you absorb. So when you begin to understand all these things, when I said to you, be like the Sphinx, go outside, I'll show you another practical trick. Anytime you're in the sun, Here's one of the big modern mismatches. These are my shoes. I don't own a pair of shoes that have rubber on the bottom. I want you to think common sense. Why? Because the right. earth, exactly, the earth is an anode. It releases free electrons. Your feet are designed to be connected to it so that you can absorb more UV light here in the eye clock and the eye camera, but also on your skin, assuming that it's exposed. That's why I always tell my members, Think about the Sphinx every morning. Do what the Sphinx does. And this is where to begin to make some sense to your ladies who are overweight. And it's very, very easy to understand obesity from my perspective. Your mitochondria have an input. It's called electron chain transport. So let's just stop there. Electrons, okay? Forget about proteins. Forget about carbohydrates. Forget about fats, okay? The output of mitochondria is oxygen. Everybody knows about that, we breathe it. So the more electrons you put in and the more oxygen you have, the faster electrons flow down that chain. Here's the key thing. This guy that you heard me mention before, named Einstein, came up with this thing called a photoelectric effect. What does that mean? It means light can turn to electrons and electrons can turn to photons, okay? So the more light you assimilate through your surfaces, the more electrons you provide to your mitochondria. The more electrons you provide to your mitochondria, the less food you have to eat. Why do you want no shoes on or leather shoes? Because leather transmit electrons, you get more free electrons here. So in other words, that's the snack that you want to eat six, seven, eight times a day. The sun is the other snack, not the grapes, not the crackers, not the apples. You start doing this, and you'll start to notice within probably six, I, I tell you six weeks to about 12 weeks, all of a sudden your cravings go completely away and you're eating one meal a day. Why is the one meal a day important? There's this thing that Anna has probably told you all about numerous times called intermittent fasting. Fancy name for I don't eat that much. Why is that important? Guess how you recycle mitochondria. You can do it through exercise, but what's the best way? Eating one meal a day, fasting, okay? That's one of the easiest ways to do it. Does it cost you anything to do? Nope. All you have to do is act like the Sphinx. Why does ketosis or fats work in this whole program we're talking about? Very simple. Again, you don't have to know a lot about chemistry here. That's the best part of the practical applications. When you eat one, say, mole, that's what we call it in chemistry, of glucose, and eat one mole of fat. Anna will tell you, the glucose gives you 36 ATP. One mole of fat gives you 147. So third grade math, which one's better? Mm. Got it? You get more electrons from fat than you do from carbohydrates. So that's why ketosis helps you. But here's the key. When you begin to understand what I just said, you're going to say, wait a minute. If I'm more sphinx light, do I really need to eat Keto, or keto, ketogenic constantly? The answer is going to be no if you're more connected to the sun and the ground. But here's the problem. Most of your modern life is built around beliefs and around jobs and around family that disconnect you from that. So guess what the take-home message is? Become more connected. Control your environment so that you have the availability 
to get the free things from nature so that you do not have to offset it with food because all food gives us is electrons to run our programs when we're disconnected. It's built in. People think that food is really fundamental. I always point this out to people. That's why my tree is one of my best teaching partners. We sit in my, my purple rocking chairs out there and I say to all my members that come visit me, I said, tell me how much that tree eats. I said, you wanna hear something else that's funny? The wood in that tree is made out of thin air. Light, water, and carbon dioxide form wood. Guess what? The matter in you is formed exactly the same way. Mm. You are formed out of the same things. The difference is you don't understand how the process works. The middleman in us is that mitochondria. The, the input and the output happens to be light and it happens to be oxygen. And once you understand how growth and metabolism really works, this is why I tell everybody. It's a light first story. I think that those are huge points and how we're living our life and we're connected more to outside and then doing what we can, protecting ourselves inside, right? So close on inside, off outside and, and um, exposing our, our windows to the soul, right? Our eyes, exposing our eyes to the sunlight. And, um, but, you know, a few... For ladies who listen to this too, I just told the girls on my site this, and you'll be interested to hear this. Even if you're a mom, one piece or two piece, I'd rather you go with two piece, but they now make a UV bathing suit for men and women that actually allows the light to go too. So technically you're covered, but the sun still gets you. Um, based on where you live, because I, I don't want you to get a toxic dose of the sun. That's why I would tell you about the D-Minder app. If you play with it for like two or three days, you're gonna figure out very quickly how much sun you need to get. The key point that I want to make to people is that the morning sun for growth and metabolism, especially if you're overweight, have an autoimmune condition, or have a serious disease that you're trying to fix, the AM sun is irreplaceable. Let me say that again. There is no way around that fact, okay? Mm -hmm. So that means when that sun rises, wherever you are, you need to be up looking at that sun for a period of time because that sets the circadian clock in your eye. That's how the whole program starts. Then as much as you can get after that, that's, that's what I call lanya. That's what we call it here in Louisiana. When you get that little extra, um, it's a nice thing. Uh, oh, you change your shoes. Just go find yourself a place to get you know, shoes. I just did this yesterday. I bought a brand new pair of shoes. And my, my cobbler always laughs at me. I bring these shoes in. He says, Doc, because you're the only guy that brings me shoes in and takes off the rubber soles and puts leather ones on and he knows why I do it other people won't go to that extreme and I'm like look when you spend a great part of your life in an operating room around xenon bulbs and, and halogen bulbs and fake light and do what I do that was part of the reason I got to be 360 pounds 10 to 12 years ago and that was a very counterintuitive point for me then it's probably a counterintuitive point for many of you listening to this now but when you understand why I do what I do, and you start putting this together, you go, well, this makes sense because I've been on every diet known to man and nothing works. Right. Why? Because it's not a food story. It's a light story. Well, so you, you mentioned toxic, too much toxic effects of the sun. What are you referring to? You well, mean sunburn so, or? I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I want people to think about, say, black people and then think about Jack Cruz. Jack Cruz has freckles. He's Northern European. His mitochondrial haplotype from 23andMe says that I'm Northern European. So that means I'm far away from the equator. So I'm designed to work with very small amounts of light, okay? Now, a black person, let's take Usain Bolt. He lives in a subtropical zone close to the equator. His black skin protects him from the UV light. So he can spend more time in an equatorial zone than I can without having a problem. Here's the interesting part. I told you that I moved from originally from New York City, well, my family from Germany and Ireland to New York City, then to Nashville. Now I'm in, in uh, New Orleans. What, what, what happened? I built up a sun callus. In other words, I can take my Irish behind outside in sun, even in July here, for five to six hours. If I would have done that, say, four years ago when I first moved, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. See, I've actually been able to build up that other biogenic amine we talked about earlier, melanin. See, people don't realize that 
dopamine, melatonin, serotonin, and melanin are all biogenic amines that are made from three amino acids, okay? And those three amino acids are aromatic. You don't need to know what that is. They just have rings in them. What makes them special is they all absorb UV light. So the more you assimilate UV light properly, you can actually raise your game. In other words, you are not confined to the mitochondrial DNA that you inherited from your mother. In other words, there's some play in it. And you have to figure out, as you change your environment, how much play is in it. And the only way you're going to know is to get off your duff and biohack it. That's what I teach all my people to do. And I'm showing you, I, I, I live this life, and I've done it for 10 years. I used to be 360 pounds. Now I'm probably about 220, 230. And do I do things sometimes to gain weight? Last, well, two years ago, I did a biohack to gain 50 pounds back on a paleo diet to prove to people it was not the diet. It was the light. What did I do? I sat in blue light for six months while I did the biohack. Well, one thing for our listeners is that Dr. Cruz made the association between really the reasons behind seasonal affective disorder, right? Because right. serotonin, dopamine, I mean, crucial sleep disturbance is crucial to the time of year. We see this abundance, especially at this time of the year. So dopamine, serotonin being um, uh, inefficiently made. Yes. Um, that's, and that's so really what happens. It's, it's because they're inefficiently made because we don't have the proper frequencies of light because of the way we've constructed our lives. But I've already told you that the practical take home, Anna, how much does it cost to go outside when the sun rises? Oh, it's free. I love free things. Well, I mean, guess what? It's not that hard to do. The problem is what's hard is to want to change your life. And you know why change is hard? And I know you know this, Anna, but I don't think a lot of the people who are listening to this have made the connection. What does dopamine do? Dopamine is originally made in our eye in a place called the RPE. That's called the retinal pigmentum epithelium. Where does it go from there? It goes to our frontal lobes. When you have low dopamine in your frontal lobes, you know what you can't do? Change. The other thing you can't do, you don't see trends. Okay? What happens after the frontal lobes in humans? It goes to your brainstem. Where is that located? You've probably heard of this it's called the substantia nigra. Okay? When that gets destroyed, you get a disease called Parkinson's disease, okay? Dopamine is also located in the frontal and temporal lobes. What happens when it gets destroyed there? It's another disease you may have heard of. It's called Alzheimer's disease, okay? All of these things are linked to light, and okay? You need to understand what you've been told by your doctors, by medical school, by the things that you read in Oprah's magazine are all wrong. Okay, and most of the, the things that nature provides for us are good. The problem is we need to understand how to use it. That's why I tell a lot of my good friends who are really religious, I said, you know, the Bible had it right. It said, let there be light. The problem is God didn't tell you what the recipe was after that. You have to live your life figuring it out. I think the problem is we've gotten too smart for our own bridges. We've created a world that actually has created alien suns around us brought us from outside, inside. So in that sense, I almost look at our houses almost as the Garden of Eden, uh, where the apples lie. And that's a very counterintuitive way to, to look at what we're doing to ourselves, but that's functionally what we really are. And the cool part of my story is, none of what I'm telling you right now is gonna cost you very much money. All you have to do is realize that change, doing these changes will be hard for you because you have low dopamine in your frontal lobes. But if you do them very quickly, you're going to say, hmm, this is interesting. And that willpower will carry on into other things. So for my listeners, I called Jack the other day because I've been working on my magic menopause plan, right? And that's the, okay, why all of a sudden what I was doing wasn't working anymore. And certainly things have changed inside more. So really getting my body into ketosis, but also making sure I have enough of the greens on board to have that alkaline state. And I think where that's working is this whole photoelectric charge is improving my absorption of light and also the, you know, internal magnetism, right? The electron charge. And so that creating the fat loss and 
and detoxification, right? Healthy detoxification, healthy fat loss. We'll hold on to our fat if we're toxic uh, as a safety mechanism and helping with that release and also promoting sanity. And I want to say for women, one meal a day may not fuel our neurotransmitters as compared to men. I think men are more designed for that one meal, Jack, versus women. I would, t I would tell you the women eventually who do this long term, my wife happens to be one of them. My wife, she'll kill me when I say this, but she's older than me. She's 57 years old. She looks better now than she did when she was in high school. Nice. So, and I will tell you that it took her five years to listen to me. That, the, the problem is when you're married to somebody who is doing something different. And I, I, this is a very important story probably for your listeners to hear. My wife stood in the shower every day when I went through my change. And for those of you who don't know, I lost 77 pounds in three months and 133 and 11 because I didn't even believe that this worked. My wife watched it. This is almost 10 years ago now. And she didn't do anything with this information for five years. Do you know why? Because her dopamine level was extremely low. We lived at the time in Nashville. And I told her, I said, Sandy, you need to take your clothes off and come outside with me like I do every morning. And this woman was religious. I would be outside at 530 in the morning in December and January waiting for the sun to rise on my deck. My hair would be frozen. And she just looked at me. She goes, I just cannot believe you're doing this. And I told her, I said, let me explain something to you about dopamine. So not only does UV light make it, but do you know that cold makes dopamine as well? See, there's two pathways. See, biochemistry is thermoplastic. Well, Why? We think about cold making that brown fat, so that increasing the mitochondria, more metabolically efficient. No, cold gets rid, it activates brown fat to actually become a fat burner. So what are you doing? You're turning the furnace on. That's the whole point. And when I started to make these links for her, She's like, you know, she dipped her toe in the water. She said, you know, I'm going to start trying this. And I knew it was probably about five, six years ago when she climbed into the pool with me in January when it was about 28 degrees. She goes, no, I'm going to try this. And she tried it. And I said, okay, now just come out because it was sunny. I said, sit outside. And I said, I want you to look in the direction of the sun for just 15 or 20 minutes with me. Not directly at it, just off to the side. And in the beginning, the first three or four days, she would tear and cry because, you know, the bright light bothered her. I said, just so you know, that's a sign that you have low dopamine in your brain. Wow. And she goes, okay, and I'll keep doing it. And within three or four days, tearing stopped. She's like, you know, the crazy thing is I'm starting to sleep better, Jack. And I said, isn't that interesting the way dopamine makes melatonin? So I sat her down. And she's like, hmm. So she kept doing it and doing it and doing it. She didn't say anything to her girlfriends, nothing. Uh, about six months in, she had dropped about 40 pounds. She was down to eating two meals a day. And the crazy thing is what she was eating changed dramatically. She would eat salads with seafood in it because we haven't talked about that part yet. How do you harness sunlight best, DHA? But it's got to be from seafood. And – Every time my wife got a little small clinical win, she asked me for the new part of the story. In other words, I gave her a new crumb to think about. And then the next thing you know, it was about six months in, she was doing everything I was doing and she didn't, I didn't have to twist her arm, but it took her five years to get it. And you know what I told her? I said, Sandy, the most important thing to me is I don't care if you want to kill yourself. I'm fine if you don't want to do this. I said, but do you realize that we've got kids and the kids are looking at you. They're looking at me. They see my change and they're kind of shocked. But they want to know why mom's not doing anything. And I said, when they see wow. you change, they're going to change. And here's the best part of the story. This is the most counterintuitive part that I'm ever going to say to a woman. Because I told this to my wife. I'm going to tell it to you and your listeners. You have to realize that you are no good for your family until you are good for yourself. When I told my wife that the first time, she looked at me like I was an alien. And I said, why did I do this, Sandy, without you in the beginning? That's the reason why. I said, I knew that if this really worked, this could change everything about us. Now, you know, 10, 12 years later, I got two kids that I don't have to worry about. They don't use, my son is a senior at UT Knoxville, up close to where you are. 
studying to be an engineer about building new, a new world that uses proper light frequencies to help people because he got optimized when he was 15 years old. Uh, my daughter, she's 15 now. All of our friends that come over, they all have these blue blocking screens. They wear the glasses. They don't think my, my daughter's crazy anymore. They're like, you know, this is nuts when I'm doing this. I'm sleeping. None of her friends are, are able to sleep. Why? They have the cell phone right by their head, and they're constantly texting. That's why I said to you earlier, when, you, you know, you shunned, I could see your face when, you, when I said it. It is child abuse. The problem is it's people – back away when I say it because they don't understand the physics behind it. But when you understand it, then you begin to say, woof. So the blue blocker screens that we put on the iPads and iPhones, it's a, it's a help. It's, it's a huge help. But see, the one that the iPhone just came out with, the new iPhone's coming out with something called Night Shift. It's not good enough. I, you can see mine has a screen on it. I'll put it on. I don't know if you can see it. It blocks. It's got a screen that goes over it. On the computers, unfortunately, it's not on now because we're in the middle of the day. There's a program called Flux. F L U X. Everybody should have it. Because yeah. at night when you use it, when I'm on the computer at night, I wear these. I have this and I have all my skin covered. Okay. That, and the irony is that that's the key. That's the time to keep your skin covered. But during the day is when you want to reverse the process. You want everything uncovered as much as you can. But the key stimulus, as soon as the sun rises, I want you looking in the direction of the sun. And what people need to understand, it's not going to hurt you in the morning because there's no UV light. There's no UVA, no UVB. The only place that's not true is at an equatorial existence. And right now, only 6% of the world's population lives on the equator. 94% live away from it. 80% are outside the tropics. So this, this, Information really is for everybody. We all need to be looking in the direction of the sun when it rises every morning. When you're driving in your car to work, what's the easiest biohack? I already told you that glass blocks UVA light. If you have a, a moonroof, open it up. You have a little window. You don't have to open it all the way up to freeze your ass off. Just crack it this much. You know why? The light gets in. That's that whole photoelectric effect. You don't, a little sliver will still get it in. This is what I do, just like that and you, you're getting it. I happen, I just bought my wife a brand new car. This will show you how she's changed. I just bought it three days ago. Um, I bought her a hard top retractable convertible because she said to me, she goes, you know, she goes, I need to be in a car that's going to give me sunlight way more. And my wife has got darker skin than I do. She's, uh, I call her my brown princess because she's, she's, she gets really dark in the, in the summertime. And what keep, the reason why it's a big deal for my wife is the darker your skin is, the more UV light you need. So I said to her, fine, I'm, I'm going to go out and buy you the car because now she understands the importance of it. But the key thing is my daughter has got skin like me. When they're together, I want them to get it. So now my wife is actively parenting by not telling my daughter what she's really doing. So when Callie says, oh, yeah, we got this cool car. She's like, yeah, let's go put it in and put the top down. So when she goes to school in the morning, my daughter is getting light that before she would fight with my wife about. Oh, it's beautiful. And that's a good practical application. You're, you know, imagine teenagers resistant at many levels. So you got to be sneaky about it sometimes. Well, just what hold- about wearing the sun, you know, just a hat, even if you're not wearing eyeglasses? Well, you is could that do that. going to be fine? There's a, there's a lot of different little tricks. The main thing that I want to give to people is to, to know that the sun in the morning is not our enemy. It's actually our friend. And any way y'all can do it, I want you to do it. Um, and you don't have to tell people. This is the coolest part of what I'm teaching people. You don't have to tell people all the signs. I don't have to teach you all that. I, I have a saying that I use with my members and I'll share it with you here. You don't have to speak Mandarin Chinese to know that you like Chinese food, do you? So that means you don't need to know quantum physics. You don't need to know all the details of quantum electrodynamics like I do. Now, if you want to sit down with me and get a bottle of wine and have a discussion about really how this works, come down to New Orleans. No problem. I will blow your mind. All you have to do is read one of my blogs and you'll understand how detailed this goes. Why? Because I told you when we started this podcast. 
I am still pissed off that I was lied to for my whole life through, you know, high school, you know, college, medical school, that I did not learn this stuff. And the crazy thing is, uh, it aggravates me. And it aggravates me to this day because I know how many people in the first 15 years of my career that I hurt, I didn't do it with intent, but I know that I hurt them. And that's the reason why I am passionate about not dealing in half-truths anymore. And Anna, you know, when I see somebody who's dealing in a half-truth, I ain't that nice a guy. No, no, you're forthright and forthcoming. But again, you know, we have, we're here on a journey for lessons and learning and for our best self, right? We have divine purposes within us. And one thing where I am angry is because, you know, I grew up with food as medicine, traditional wisdom. My mom passed down Middle Eastern generational knowledge. And in America, she became very, very sick and died at age 67, uh, undergoing her second heart surgery. And if I knew then what I know now, my mom would be uh, celebrating her 88th birthday. But I mean, it's huge. It was such a big aspect of my growth as a doctor. You're going to be able to teach all these ladies that are following you what you couldn't teach your mother. Yeah. So to me, life is lived through the windshield, not through the rearview mirror. It may bother you because it's your family. But the thing is, no one can hold you at fault when you truly didn't know. That's part of my struggle is that I know I didn't know, but I'm still pissed off about it. And when I talk to other doctors about this, A, they're usually floored. Uh, and B, the patients usually take to this way more because they've already had the existence that I had before that they've tried everything and nothing else works. And then they go, wait a minute, is it really this simple that I just have to embrace the sun, drink good water, and try to stay away from non-native electromagnetic fields. If you do those three things, those top three, I promise you, you will not get wallet biopsied by my profession. You'll probably stay as far away from my operating room table as possible. And the way I look at it, it's not that you're going to live to 120 years old, but this is what I tell people. You will live a full life. You'll die falling off your roof, replacing it at 80, 85 years old. Why? The key thing is none of us want to be sick for 25 years before we die on 14,000 medications, spending more money on medicine than we do on food. And, and the key thing is the other way that we raise dopamine, because there's lots of other ways to do it, is what we're doing now when we share with each other. One of the things I hate about our modern life is that we don't go out and talk to people anymore. We don't get outside. One of the things I love about my house here, since it's a walking city, every Friday and Saturday, I go out and find tourists and I open up a bottle of champagne and I just share with them. And they like look at me like, is this normal? And I'm like, it's normal for the city. Right, I would say the, the idea of sitting on the beach with a laptop will surely be the quickest route to death, loneliness, depression, and suicide. I mean, it is not our ideal existence. And I like what you said, you know, we can agree to tear the, uh, tear the rear view mirror off our, off our wall. That's key. And uh, you said the right kind of water. So there's all kinds of water, bottled water, filtered water. What should our listeners what choices should we make with water? Because we are predominantly water, and that is key. You said DHA, seafood, oysters. I'm a big fan of oysters. The, the, the big, the big thing with water is I tell people there's a, a website. I can't remember what it is called. Find a spring. You can Google it. Uh, first thing you need to do, based on where you live, make sure that the water table is okay. Like if you live in a place like Flint, Michigan, uh, go buy your water from somewhere else. Um, I happen to be fortunate down here, as Anna knows, the Southeast, uh, the two major advantages, let's just talk about latitude a little bit more. Why the Southeast of the United States is so incredibly powerful. A, we have great water. We have great light. So that knocks that out. The other thing that people don't know is that 600 miles from where I am right now, there's a big hole in the ground where an asteroid hit 65 million years ago. And believe it or not, that's where we all came from. That's where eukaryotes, that's where dinosaurs got taken out and the age of mammals began. Well, it turns out that the Gulf of Mexico has so much seafood in it, which makes it unusual because many people don't know this. The, de the, the equator 
all the water around the equator is an equatorial dead zone for sea life. Most sea life lives at the poles, but the Gulf of Mexico is a, um, an exception to the rule. And the reason why is because of that hole in the ground. It connects the magma chamber closer to the water so there's more magnetic flux. So that's the reason why when you go fishing off one of the oil rigs here, you can get tremendous seafood. If you've not been to Pensacola, Destin, New Orleans, Gulfport, seafood's everywhere. I mean, you can't get away from seafood, you know, from Key West all the way around. The people don't know why. That's one of the reasons why. The water here, we get tons of rain. Uh, the water here is great. But you'll notice that Jack Cruz is drinking, and I don't know if you can see it. It's called Starkey. I'll read it yeah. to you. Starkey spring water from Idaho, uh, two miles deep. It's a geothermal single source from Mother Nature. Notice the pH on the back. What does it say? 9.4. Yeah. So this, this came from another place. Why do I do that in New Orleans? Because the water here is fluoridated. You never want to drink any water that's fluoridated. Why? Very simple. You don't have to know the physics. It's based on something called the dielectric point. Anytime there's fluoride or bromide in the water, it reduces the amount of light that can be absorbed by water. Okay? That's all you have to know. So I would tell you, Pellegrino is okay. Uh, the Perrier is okay. Spring water that's bottled. Try to always buy it in bottles, not in plastic. Try to keep the water out of uh, uh, the sunlight if it's in plastic because you're going to leach chemicals from the plastic in there. I think most people know that now. But I'm okay with reverse osmosis water because the water going in is not tremendously important. Uh, how your body structures the water inside you, and see, that's the story where Pollock comes in uh, and I would just tell people, if you really want to understand water, you need to go buy Jerry Pollock's book. It's called The Fourth Phase of Water. It's a third grader can understand it. I promise everybody who reads it, you'll sit there and go, how did we not know this about water? And the book is phenomenal. I mean, my wife read it and she was just like, you got to be kidding me. Everybody thinks bulk tap water is the same as water everywhere else. It's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and the water inside our cells, but the most important one is the water inside our blood is even more important. And that is where it becomes a light story. And it turns out that me and Anna were taught something even today that is still 100% believed, but 100% flawed, is that ATP from our mitochondria drive biochemistry. I learned 12 years ago that wasn't true because a guy named Gilbert Ling did an experiment in the 1950s that showed that there is a five-fold deficit of the amount of ATP in a cell to explain what a cell can do. What does that mean? It means that the it's kind of like saying you have a million dollars in bills and you only have $500,000 in the bank. You're broke, okay? And when you hear that, you start to go, well, where does the energy come from? And for literally probably two or three years, I struggled to figure it out. Then I came upon some Russian data about this light water connection. This is before Pollock's book was ever written. This is back in 2005. And then I started to realize what the issue was. It turns out that water and sunlight are the main battery. That's actually what drives our biochemistry. So if you think about some of the things Anna and I talked about in the beginning of this podcast, then you start to realize why being like the Sphinx is kind of important, okay? Um, I would tell you, most people, if you live in a city, don't drink any fluoridated water. Go and spend extra money. This Instead of spending money on statins, this is what you should spend your money on. Um, you, most people in the States are lucky. We can get bottled water from just about any source. Try to stay away from plastic. Like I, I try to avoid Dasani. I try to avoid any of the Coca-Cola crap. You know, any, Nestle, if Nestle owns it, I stay away from that. I spend good money on water. Down here in New Orleans, we have guys that deliver, you know, the big – five gallon things that you still always see in doctor's office. I have one in my house. I have one in my office for my girls that work for me. Um, I drink green mountain Valley water. That's a big one here in new Orleans. It also mm -hmm. comes in bottles. Uh, this darky stuff I got from whole foods because believe it or not, when I go to whole foods, all the guys in there are like doc, you need to try this water and tell us what you think. Cause I usually biohack the water. There's things that I do to figure it out. Uh, one of my good buddies, Ruben Salinas, who's a co-inventor with me of a device, he has this camera that I was telling Anna about called the GDV camera. 
And a GDB camera, actually, we can use this to biohack the water in us. After we drink it, we can actually see what the energy flows are in our body, and then we can make determinations whether this was good, bad, or indifferent, and then we can decide, is this a product that we're going to use or not? Um, but I would tell most people that spring water from a spring in your area, as long as it's good, is fine. The way to do that is take a little, you know, sample, like a urine specimen come from your doctor's office, take it to the local water board. It'll cost you 25 bucks. They'll test the water for you. You're good. Every place in the States around has these springs. There's actually a website that you can Google to find it. If you are, if you really want to see one of my, I, I don't like calling him a crazy friend. He's an amazing guy. His name is Luke Story. He is one of the most famous stylists in all of Los Angeles. If you go to his website, you will see the things that he does to harvest water from the LA basin. He goes on the top of a mountain, found a spring. That's almost a two hour drive, bought a pickup truck and he fills this whole big truck up with this water and he drives it back to Los Angeles. It's the only thing he drinks and bathes with. Wow. And he is all in. Um, now, you don't have to be that um, tight. Luke does it because he lives in a toxic EMF zone. So that's the reason why he goes above and beyond, uh, because he can't physically change his city because of what he does. Uh, that's where he has to be. So if you know that you live in a really bad area, that means that you have to do extraordinary things. So that's when you have to get all the things right. Um, but water for most people, especially in the Southeast, is not an issue. It's a real problem in the Southwest of the United States, which happens to be one of the only other places in the United States where sunlight is good. The problem with the Southwest is that the sun's good, but the water stinks and there's natural fluoride in the water like in the California basin in Arizona and New Mexico. So you have to be careful about the water out there. Mm. Well, those are excellent points. Tell people about, you know, step into the future with the Quantlet device that you created. Well, it goes back to the original, original thing that we had talked about in podcasts. I realized with Ruben about two years ago that all this biophysics data of how light, water, and magnetism comes together. It's kind of like what you had asked me before we came on the podcast. How do we, how do we make this really simple for people without, you know, trying to change their entire existence? So I said to Ruben, I said, what if we created another eye? And he looked at me. And this happened right on my porch out here. With and a bottle had, of wine. No, there was no wine this time. <laughs> it was actually in the middle of a thunderstorm. And we had the GDV camera out because he wanted to see the difference in the local environment when a huge storm was coming through. And I said to him, I said, Ruben, you know, if we build an eye somewhere on the body, we can actually deliver light frequencies that we're missing. So remember what we said earlier, we're missing purple and we're missing red. I said, what if we make a device over an imperfect black box radiator? What does that mean? Our pupil is a perfect black box radiator in physics. That means it allows light in and allows the light out. That's why it works so well with the sun. That's how we get the light energies into our brain to do the things that it does. I said, if we look somewhere on the body and we find a perfect, or I should say an imperfect black box radiator, what does that mean? It means that we're looking for an arterial cascade that meets a venous cascade so that there's a big change of, of arterial and venous blood that we want to load with light frequencies and we want to use cold to do it. Why? What I told you before about the leaf and my wife in the pool. When you cool a surface, you absorb more UV and more IR light. So I got the idea actually reading some uh, data from Harvard University and Stanford University about six, seven years ago, they came up with this thing for uh, athletes, high performance athletes, which was called the Stanford glove. And it was this big, huge glove that went on the hand and it had a vacuum pull device, you know, that pulled the surface blood vessels up and they were actually able to cool it and they would cool their body down. They found that their athletic performance went up tremendously just by doing this alone. They started using it with athletes. The problem was when these guys work out, you can't wear this huge thing on your hand. So they were losing the benefit. So I had been thinking about all the things I was doing with the leptin prescription and cold thermogenesis. And I said, you know, the thing that these guys are forgetting 
what's the thing that pulls blood vessels up to the surface best? Nice. UV light. Mm. Sunlight. I said, why don't we just introduce specific light frequencies over the radial artery, which is an artery every doctor and I think every patient knows because that's where we check your pulse. Anybody can feel it now. Well, it turns out this has something that's also really beneficial that anesthesiologists use anytime you put someone to sleep. We put this little red thing on your finger called a pulse oximeter, and that tells us how much oxygen is in the blood. So I explained to Ruben, the more UV and IR light we get in the blood, the higher the oxygen level goes up. You technically don't need lungs to breathe. You can actually use light to breathe. And he looked at me like I was crazy, and I gave him all the data about it. And he goes, let me get this straight. You think that we can cool the radial artery and put UV and IR light through it to act just like our eye? I said, it won't be just like our eye, but it's going to be awfully good. And that's what we did. We came up with the Quantlet device, and that's a, it's the first quantum wearable device. And it was designed 12 feet from where I am right now in the middle of a thunderstorm utilizing a GDV camera. And we came up with different iterations of it. Um, it's, you know, out now. You can actually go to our Indiegogo page and look at it. There's only five days left from today um, where the device is, has been out. It's been out for about 30 days. Um, our goal, if we, if we were to make this and sell it, um, like, say, in Walmart, it would probably cost five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 to, to make we decided to go with a crowdfunding thing because our goal is to try to get it in everybody's hands. And we think if we can meet our initial goal that we can sell it for probably between four and $600. That'd be amazing. Well, not only that, it'd probably be the first wearable device that won't kill you like the Fitbit or the iWatch or, you know, a cell phone, because what we're doing is we're putting energy back into your body while your environment is sucking it out. Right. Uh, and as long as you use these and your skin and your gut and your lungs to do the right things with this, this may be able to offset a lot of our progress or luxury beliefs that we have now. Um, and Ruben has been biohacking this huge. He's a CEO of a, a company in Germany, and he flies back and forth to uh, Boston, from Boston to Germany two or three times a month. In fact, he's in Orlando right now at a meeting. He has worn the quantlet since we've designed it. He's not got any jet lag when he flies. And the thing is, when you understand what we said before, I told you about light, dopamine, melatonin. How do you get jet lag? Melatonin drops. Well, what did I tell you? If I can add back UV and IR light, I can stimulate the repair programs to make melatonin. Can I? Well, guess what? That's what the quantlet does when he's flying. And that's the reason he doesn't get a circadian mismatch when he gets there. Um, and that's the counterintuitive thing. Most people, you know, Anna, especially in the anti-aging meetings that we go to, most people think that melatonin is, is a pill answer or it's an answer for the pineal gland. It turns out that's not true. The RPE of the eye is what makes melatonin. You have to make melatonin in your eye before it can work in the pineal gland. And see, that's the details that people miss. But when we're in the interim, as we're healing the processes, sublingual melatonin, you no think melatonin. it's not? I got a blog coming about that very soon. If you take melatonin uh, exogenously, you are destroying the endogenous clock. You never want to take melatonin. And very rarely will you hear me say, never, never or not. And I'm going to, now this is specifically for you. You know that another biogenic amine is dopamine. What do you know about dopamine when we use it as doctors? We give L-dopa to people and what happens? It only works for about a year, year and a half before they get off symptoms, right? So then they have to have deep brain stimulation because the medicine doesn't work. The same thing happens to melatonin, except it's not as obvious. So it destroys endogenous signaling. And the reason for that, if you really want to know the, the reasons why this happens, I wrote a blog and it's very detailed called time six tells you exactly the reason and how this happens it turns out that there's a chemical in our body called glutathione glutathione is designed to work with uv light and dopamine and glutathione quenches and when i say quench we're now talking about a photoelectric effect quenches the effect and it's quantized to the amount of light that comes through the eye and the problem is all these people that have this disease 
are getting constant source blue, no UV. And that's the reason why um, the medications don't work. Uh, when you begin to understand how all this complex physics works through the eye, that's when you start to go, you, you look at our profession and go, man, this explains why these medicines don't work. And this explains why, the, uh, give you a perfect example. I said this earlier, and I know that you are a big proponent of bioidentical hormones. And you know that there's many people who do anti-aging medicine that talk about putting bioidentical hormones on their skin. If you listen to what I said earlier, you would know that UV light completely inactivates bioidentical hormones that are on the skin. So guess what? If you put it on, you better make sure it's covered. Otherwise, it ain't going to work. Okay? Most people never get told that. Right. Never. And that's the reason why they have to take ridiculous amounts because people don't understand how light and hormones work. It adds to why it works better when it's applied around the vulva, the inner thighs, the lower belly. Yeah, most women are not cruising around with that hanging out. No, <laughs> no, but nice. intermittent melatonin for, you know, uh, intermittent, even you're saying tiny doses of sublingual because what about the melatonin research to help with autoimmunity and breast cancer? Very simple because it's low. So when they give it, they're getting the benefit. Here's the problem that you're not realizing time scales. See, all studies are done on short time scales. What are we interested in? We're interested in on a 50, 60, 70 year window. If you lower, you know, your endogenous production, what's going to happen? I, I, I'm going to get even more controversial probably in the next six weeks on my blog when I talk about vitamin D supplementation. If you've ever sat down, you, you think uh, I'm controversial now, wait till you read that. You, can you supplement the sun? The answer is no, you can't. And you shouldn't. Guess what? Taking vitamin D has a time and place, but for most people, it's the wrong thing to do. And I'm going to explain to people why it's the wrong thing to do. And I know this is going to shock people when they hear it. But when you understand, and I'll explain it to you very simply here, because I think you'll get it and your listeners will get it. What is vitamin D3 in our body? It is the chemical signal after a light has collided with proteins in us. What does that mean? The chemical signal is only designed to be present when the photonic energy has been absorbed by our atomic lattice. So when you take vitamin D, you have the chemical, but you don't have any of the light power in your body. You think that's a good idea. Is that how you would design by nature? No, not at all. And does that have effects down the pike? The answer is yes, it does. So I'm okay when the doctor understands what I just said, when someone comes in, say, with an autoimmune condition, but I've got to get the patient to understand, we can do this temporarily to turn your immune system on and this and that, but you have to stop doing this and you have to start doing this. And if you don't do it, I'm not taking care of you. And I explain this to them, just like we talked about in this yeah. podcast. Yeah. I explain it to them in detail. And I, I, uh, the other thing I explain to them, because people don't really understand light. When sunlight hits us, we make cortisol, we make vitamin D3. Guess what else we make? We make another chemical that gets cleaved from this protein in our brain called beta endorphin. Most people know about it from runner's high. Well, guess what? That's why the sun makes us happy. And see, it comes from a chemical in the eye uh, that gets made in the brain in the hypothalamus called POMC, and it's called P-O-M-C, okay? There is about six cleavage chemicals that are made. One of them is beta endorphin. Another one is cortisol. Another one is ACTH. Another one is alpha MSH. And that's the reason why people who have Lyme disease, autoimmune conditions, always have low alpha MSH levels. They always have low beta endorphin levels. That's why they always feel like shit because they can never make these things. And it's why all autoimmune conditions are always associated with low vitamin D levels. Well, and that brings me to something, you know, I'm so passionate about the oxytocin hormone. So we're talking about that delicate balance, like we're unable to synthesize oxytocin in this milieu. And Correct. so we have PTSD harder, longer, and then the effects of chronic adrenal dysfunction, right, of the cortisol imbalance, creating that leaky membrane. That leaky membrane, if it's in the gut, if it's in the endothelium, if it's in the cardiovascular, if it's in the brain, well, the it's, impaired integrity of the cell membrane. It can, that's, that's one of the effects for sure. 
the easier way for people to think about it is that the signal through the eye is broken. So that means the paraventricular nucleus is constantly outputting. So just think about it like this. You have a circuit that's working like nuts. It's going to eventually burn out. What's the thing that balances that circuit is the vagal system. That's the parasympathetic. So what you have to realize is the parasympathetic gets completely turned off. What turns it on? UV and IR light. See, the, the parasympathetic and sympathetic system, the, the way you and I learned it, I personally think is psychotic because it doesn't make any sense. But what does make sense, this is how I break it down for people. Even if you don't know anything about light, you've probably heard physicists talk that light has two parts. It has a duality. It's a particle and a wave. Do you know fundamentally what the paraventricular nucleus and the vagus system does? One acts more on the particle side of light. The other one acts more on the wave side. In fact, I even told you this when we talked on the phone a couple of days ago, that that's the main difference between men and women. Women are designed to work with both parts of the duality of life because you're the ones that allow life to form inside you. Men don't need both parts of light. Therefore, the atomic lattice in men are different than the atomic lattice in women. And if you really want to know why men, women go through menopause, is because when they go through menopause, they're reducing the amount of the particle aspect of light they use. Why? Just think about it common sense wise. If you are designed to come out your mama and work on both sides of light, that, that uh, circuit is hot. It's always hot because you need the extra juice to give it to a baby. Well, guess what? If you kept living your life with all this extra juice, you would burn out like a, a blue straggler star. Instead, nature wants you to be more like a red giant. And what's a red giant? Red light works better on the wave part of light. Why? Because it works with water. Now I want you to think, Anna, about what I just said. What is your mitochondria release? It releases infrared light. And see, that is the key. See, that's the reason why young women have nice breasts and nice behinds, because what they don't realize is that's where they store their DHA. DHA is the chemical that turns light into an electric current. And that's the reason why men are drawn to women with big boobs and nice behinds, because nature tells the man that she's going to be able to make a baby with a big brain and a brain that works, that can make dopamine, melatonin, melanin, and all the biogenic amines we talked about. But here's you can the add the shiny hair onto that one too, the other trigger. There's, there's no question about it. All these things tell us that you are a lightning rod for the sunlight. Now, no man, I know my, when I talk about this with my wife and her friends, she hates that I can break sex down just like this, and it even gets deeper. Even if we talked about diff different sexual proclivities, and how it fundamentally works would blow your mind. And I, I kid you not, but it's all photoelectric power. Women use light differently than men. And the, and the, the key thing is once y'all realize it, then you begin to say, hmm, this is the reason why we need to do things a little bit differently. And until doctors, especially anti-aging doctors and OBGYNs really understand how women differ with the use of light and water, we're not really going to solve ladies' problems. And that's part of the reason why I believe if I can teach ladies about light and water, uh, they're going to be far along in the game. The key thing is, is finding a doctor like you who actually is not going to dismiss them and throw them out of the office and say, well, you're batshit crazy. You know, because it's not crazy. The thing is, women can get back what they've lost. They need to understand they are designed by nature differently for a reason. And when you understand what that reason is and why your life changes, I, I would tell every woman when they get off, listen to this podcast, go pull your pictures out when you're 18, 28, 38, 48, and 58. And if you got any of your boobs and your butt, really look at them. You know what you're going to notice? There's a huge change there. And all of you get pissed off about it, and you shouldn't. Why? Because you don't need big boobs anymore. You don't need, you know, an ass that looks like a Brazilian dancer. But you want it. And, and that's why the plastic surgeons are happy you want it. They'll put fake stuff in you. You need to realize that your body is depleting its DHA for a reason. Every time you have a child, you are designed to deplete. Then you have to replete, okay? This is the reason why autistic babies 
happen much more frequently these days because women are depleted and never get repleted. And they live in an alien sun world in non-native EMF. They don't understand that non-native EMF and blue light destroy DHA levels. Not only in your boobs, not only in your butt, but guess where? Here. And right. here's, here's the take home. What is the one tissue in the body that has more DHA than any other? The retinal pigmentum epithelium that works with what? Sunlight. Mm. That's how it works. Well, and that whole, you know, we mentioned autism and then that connection with the microbiome also responding to our light and our electromagnetic and our water. Yeah, right? but people, people don't understand how the microbiome fundamentally works with light. And we can get into it a little bit. Um, you have to know a little bit about a research. I want to go back to the differences between men and women because you started it. That's, that's a, but that's another, that's another podcast because that is... Uh, we'll do have, it. You, you have to know a little bit more about light and water. And this is what I will tell you. If your listeners and you go out and buy these two books and assimilate them before I come back on, then you're going to understand why they are different. The name of the first book I've told you is Gerald Pollock, The Fourth Phase of Water. Yes. The second book is written by a guy named Roland Van Wick. You spell his first name R-O-E-L-A-N-D, Van, V-A-N, Wick, W-I-J-K. Uh, his book is called Light Sculpting Life. Um, that's pretty much everything you need to know about light, and Pollock's book is everything you need to about water. You need to know a couple more things, but I can cover that in the podcast. When it comes to the microbiome, no one in medicine has a clue how it works, but I can give it to you very simply. Um, Fritz Popp was a, a physicist in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and one of the things that he became famous at is he proved what the Russians found in 1923 – that every single cell on this planet emits extreme low frequency UV light. That's actually the stimulus to mitosis. Here's the key thing. Eukaryotes, which we are, and this may be over the head of some of your listeners, but it's important for you to hear because you can probably dissect this out from them further. Eukaryotes are the most complex portions of light, life. That, all eukaryotes showed up on planet Earth 580 million years ago in an event called the Cambrian Explosion. It happened literally within 30 million years Every bit of life that's on the planet right now started then. The only two kingdoms that were present before us were archaea and bacteria, which are called prokaryotes. Here's where it gets interesting. Your microbiome is made out of prokaryotes. What's the big difference between prokaryotes and us? They don't have mitochondria. We do. And here's the key thing. They release 5,000 times more light than a eukaryotic cell. Our cell is designed to contain them. Why? All our cell membranes are loaded with what? DHA. Prokaryotes don't have any DHA. So you know what that means? Bacteria are killed by UV light, and we are, we are able to use the photoelectric effect. That's the key differentiating point. So when you understand that we have between, depending on who you believe, between 100 million to a trillion or 100 trillion uh, microbiome cells or bacteria in our gut, what does that mean? When you eat, what did I say to you before about sunlight on your skin? That sunlight on your skin brings the blood to the surface because of nitric oxide. Light draws things. So when you eat, you're delivering electrons to those bacteria. What do they do? They begin to release light. What's the inside of your gut? It's a lumen filled with eukaryotic cell membranes that have what? DHA. It turns the light from the microbiome in from a photonic signal to a DC electric current. DC electric current sits right next to what, Anna? The GALT, the gut-associated lymphatic tissue, the biggest immune organ in the body. Want to know where autoimmune disease starts? It starts from an unyoking of UV and IR light here and here. You can't fix an autoimmune condition with food. You got to fix it here. Mm. Okay? These two things work together. Why? Think about what you learned in medical school. When you eat, what happens? Peristalsis stops. These don't release any light. So what happens when you're watching the idiot box at night, getting blue light through your eye, and then you start snacking on crackers and chips? You just turned on the signal here with no UV light here. It's the perfect mix. What did you just do? You 
cause the circadian mismatch of T regulator cells in your gut that control both arms of immunity. That is how you make autoimmune disease. Anyone you want to, you know, figure out, it just depends on which mitochondria you destroy in that tissue. How do you destroy mitochondria? What I told you before, the heteroplasmy in that tissue. So if it's in the thyroid, you get Hashimoto's. If it's in your brain at the aquaporphyrin gate, you get MS. If it happens to be at a protein in your collagen called MM, MMP9, you get rheumatoid arthritis. Everything is a circadian mismatch. Everything is related to light. And the problem is nobody understands it. And then the reversal of it for all of those conditions comes down to the same thing. Well, you have to change the environment that you've allowed. In other words, when I teach you how to mind your mitochondria, it's going to start with your eye. Then it's going to go to your skin. And the last thing you're going to get right is your gut and your lungs. See, those are the four main services that we're designed to work with. I always tell my members that we are basically a Con Edison light bulb by nature. And you have to understand that the frequencies that we use during the day are blue, green, and red. Okay. The ones that we regenerate with are UV and red. If you just think about just the basics of that alone and think about what your doctors have taught you, they've taught you to fear UV light. And that's the reason why we're getting sick. Not only that, when Tesla and Westinghouse electrified the planet in 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair, I'll challenge anybody to go back and pull out any data you want to see and you want to know when all Neolithic diseases spiked, that's it. Because, you know, I've had some of my members say to me, hey, doc, you know, MS was uh, clearly present in 1832 before all this. I'm like, yeah. Did the ladies have clothes on? Because clothes will cause a mismatch. It'll take longer to get there, but you'll still get there. The problem is now it's fast forwarded. This is the reason why. I mean, before your mom died, if you would have asked your mom, mom, do you remember seeing all these people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's when she was a little girl? You never saw it. I'll tell you a funny story about my residency. I, uh, when I was at LSU, uh, we have a big um, a hospital down here called Oshner that's kind of known as the Mayo Clinic of the mm -hmm. South. And J.O., who is his son, big Oshner's son, was a cardiovascular surgeon. And his dad was still alive when I was like a first or second year resident. He says, come on, Jack, I want you to introduce you to my dad. I, I got to meet the original Oshner, Alton Oshner. And he told me the story that he brought medical students in the 1920s to see cases of lung cancer because you may never see these again. That's how rare they are. So when he told me that, I went back and looked in the archives of where I did my residency, which is a charity hospital, which is now closed. We had the best medical records going back to the 1850s. I found out that in 1900, that colon cancer was the 37th leading cause of cancer. Today, it's number two. So if you believe what the oncologists are telling you, that genetics cause cancer, tell me how in five, five generations that we went from 37 to two. You know what happened in the same time? Tesla and Westinghouse made the electric circuit. And then we started to bring turn DC current to AC current. AC current is one of the worst things you can do. Why? In around me right now, that electric power grid oscillates at 60 hertz. You can Google that and see. You know what your mitochondrial membrane oscillates at? 100 hertz. So that is a resonance frequency problem, okay? Just think about it like this. For people who don't understand physics, think about the old days when you drove your car on an AM radio underneath the power line and you heard a that's exactly the same effect. Why is this a big deal for Europeans? Their power grid is 50 hertz. That means they're more at risk because of the way our mitochondria are built. That's part of the reason why, if you look at Scandinavia, they have more obesity, more autoimmunity, and more type 2 diabetes than almost any other place on the planet. And the interesting thing with all of these things is if you look at cancer, autoimmunity, uh, and obesity, the further you get away from the equator, they all get worse. It's not just MS. Everybody in medicine knows it's MS. It's all of them. Why? What does vitamin D and cold both do? They decrease vibrations on cell membranes. What do we know from physics? Anything that vibrates releases more electrons. 
What did I tell you before? When we lose electrons, we can't create a battery in water. If we can't create a battery in water, are we losing or gaining energy, Anna? Or losing? Guess what? When you lose energy, what happens to mitochondria? It doesn't become as powerful, so it goes through this heteroplasmy and it slowly builds up over a decade, over a decade, over a decade. So you go from bad vision, myopia, glaucoma, crazy, depressed, Lexapro. Oh, Lexapro's got fluoride in it. It gets worse. Oh, now I have Hashimoto's. Oh, and then I got cancer and I die at 67 years old. And what was the main effect? The percent of heteroplasmy change in mitochondria has nothing to do with the DNA, has nothing to do with the genome. See, this is what Doug Wallace is teaching us, and we're not listening. Mm -hmm. Some of us are. Well, I think we're creating a new tide in medicine. And then again, what's very reassuring is that we have a lot of power as individuals in changing our environment and changing the way we're thinking about it, which brings me to the point of with this understanding between current, right, our electromagnetic potential and current, and how our thoughts create change. And I know you got to go, my gosh, thank you so much for your time. But when we're, are the way we're thinking, and we know how that changes time, how that changes our body and our physiology. Yeah, it does. I mean, here's the great thing about physics that everybody listening to this should feel good at. As bad as we screw things up, we also have the potential to fix things if we're willing to alter the environment. I mean, I'm a perfect walking example of it. When I was 40 years old, six foot two, 360 pounds, I was a complete asshole, typical neurosurgeon. Uh, you would have never heard me talk about any of this stuff at that time. And then when I got my injury on my knee and somebody told me, hey, look, I think I know why this happened to you, my whole world changed. The, I mean, literally, the rabbit hole I jumped down not in a million years did I ever think 12 years later I'd be sitting on the internet talking to an OBGYN about this. Not in a million years. And the thing is, this is what makes me passionate now. I can talk about this all day long. I don't want to talk about neurosurgery. You know why? Neurosurgery is kind of like a car mechanic. When you crash your car into the wall, yeah, we can fix that. That's what we should do. But most of the people listening to this have chronic diseases that can't be fixed by the operations that we were taught. Mm -hmm. In fact, they have to be fixed with brain surgery or spine surgery without a scalpel. And that's what we talked about today. We talked about the cosmic wand. The cosmic wand is light. What is it interactive? What's its canvas? Water. What organizes the whole interaction between light and water? Magnetism. Where's magnetism based in? The mitochondria. When you understand how all these things work together, then you create your masterpiece. And that's the only way it can be done. And if you think by taking a supplement, a medicine, a food a prescription is going to get you there faster, you cannot innovate nature, my friend. Mm. That, is, that is my definition of arrogance. And that's coming from somebody who's pretty arrogant. <laughs> well, I think that you cannot innovate nature is key and is grounding that we rely on it for everything, honoring our environment, honoring our natural body, right? How we were designed, honoring our natural design and the natural design of what's around us, using that to heal us and keep it as healthy as possible is key. I know you have to go. Thank you so much for all your time. And I'm going to bring you back and we're going to talk about male, female, you know, electromagnetic differences and go from there. Well, I would tell you, if you want a little preview, current blog, Time 7 gets into it. Read it. It's there. Okay, we'll read it. And thank you so much. And people can find you at jackcruise.com. Yeah, and they can find my book at Amazon. That's the book right there, the Epi Paleo Prescription. Basically, that cuts through the first three or four years of the blog. So if you don't want to go back and read all the hard stuff, just read the book. It's easy read. Uh, if you want some of the more difficult stuff that I've been talking about the last two years about light and water, you're going to have to read the blog. But I think you'll be interested. And I also have a form that has, you know, 250,000 people on it who've been doing this stuff over and over and over again. 
you just read the form. The form probably take you 10 years to cut through, but there's so many cool stories on there. Um, I would just tell you, uh, I, I'm thinking of one person off the top of my head. Read her journal in the Optimal Journal part. Her name is Kate Tyler. I think she goes as Miss, Mr. Pinkies on the board. She's a lady that was weighed as much as me. Uh, she was autistic. Her husband had Asperger's. She had two kids that had autism. She started doing all the things that we talked about today. She's not autistic anymore. Her husband's not on the spectrum. Both kids have tested off the spectrum. Their story was so shocking that I had a movie maker go out and they did, they interviewed her and she's in the movie. It's called Supercharged. Um, they interviewed a couple of them, my patients. It's possible. When, when people tell you it's not possible, that tells me that they haven't thought long enough about how nature really works. I, I will never tell any, anybody from this point forward that something's not possible because I did impossible to me when I didn't think it can be done, and I think you can do it for you too. You just have to decide, are you willing to put the time into you? Are you worth what you should be worth? Only you can make that determination. I think we should not, we all need to say a deep breath, you know, I am worth it, right? I am worth it because it's not just about us too. It is, you know, first it stems from us, but to our children and their children and their children. And, and that's the heart of the matter. It's like when I'm out here and we're talking or putting this out and this information is to, you know, heal, heal us, heal our generations that follow us. And when I look at the disease and the children and what's happened in my field, my specialty of obstetrics and where we've gone wrong, I want to cry. I want to cry. Mm -hmm. So the more we can get out this information and, and just, again, recognize our design, honor it and enable it, right? Heal it. It's absolutely true. Yeah. So everyone can listen to this. If you're listening on my iTunes podcast, please leave a review at any questions. And also on YouTube, you can watch this video because you definitely want to see this outfit that's going on Dr. Wow. Cruz's head right now. Time for Mardi Gras. Time for Mardi Gras. Thank you. Bye-bye.